good morning to all of you. I am uh, truly delighted to be with you. I begin with a question. Uh, think of a ladder with numbers, with, with steps numbered zero at the bottom to 10 at the top. The top of the ladder uh, represents the best possible life for you and the bottom, the worst. Uh, just think about it uh, for yourself. On which step of the ladder would you say you personally stand at this time? Now, this is a question about well-being, about evaluative well-being in particular. Uh, it is not about how you feel this morning, sad or happy. It is about the a sense of your life as a whole. And what you see in countries like the US and New Zealand is that U curve where well-being varies over the life cycle. And so it tends to go down from early adulthood, uh, reaching bottom at about the mid 50s and then begins to go up. I am in the up portion of this curve, and I can tell you that it is true, at least in my case. And so the question is why? Uh, there's more than one explanation probably, but the one that seems to make sense the most to me is that the gap between where we are and our aspirations where we want to be is really high in the early part of our years. And once we reach kind of middle age or 55 or so, uh, the gap between our situations and our aspiration narrows. Uh, that is, we uh, mostly lower our aspirations. Uh, we say, yeah, that that is fine. Uh, I don't really need to have my paintings on walls of museum. Uh, I am quite happy with what I have now. So the focus of my talk is about those issues of well-being and what the role of advisors are in promoting them. Now, well-being is different from financial well-being. I'm talking about life well-being and finances are one of the domains, but the others are family and friends and health and work and education and values and society. And the point I'm making is that good financial advisors are good well-being advisors that good financial advisors are good financial physician. I've been using this analogy of financial physicians for many years, and I think that it is right uh, that in the same way that good physicians promote both health and well-being, good financial advisors promote both wealth and well-being. Uh, good financial advisors manage both investments and investors, and I would say, and I think that you would agree, that the task of managing investors is the more difficult one and the more important one. And so you're not wealth managers, you're really well-being managers. And so like good physicians, uh, you ask your client, you listen, truly listen and empathize. What does it hurt? Uh, what does your client want? There's a story I tell that I heard from a financial advisor who told me about prospects, uh, a man and his wife uh, who came and they said, before you begin to plan for us, you should know that we have a disabled son uh, and we have to establish a fund for him that will facilitate his life that will support him when we are gone. That to me is an issue. That is every family has points of pain, whether it is disabled child or an early death or poverty. Uh, and uh, it is really 
the point of financial ad advisors to get it out to to really very gently get out where it hurts and from that comes diagnosis and education and treatment and i think of you as very much like me your educators first and foremost now the point I'm making is that life well being is at the center of the third generation of behavioral finance. And I distinguish the third generation from standard finance and the first and second one. In standard finance, people are rational. Rational people want only wealth. They are immune to cognitive and emotional errors that diminish wealth. And when I talk about rational here, I talk about it as financial economists talk about it, more narrow than the usual everyday language of rational is what we would call normal smart or normal knowledgeable. Now, in the first generation, uh, we describe people as irrational, uh, who want only wealth, but are susceptible to cognitive and emotional errors that diminish wealth. For example, they, we trade too much. In the second generation that I describe, I describe people as normal, neither rational nor irrational. They want more than wealth. And that second generation is still mostly in the domain of finances addressing people in their roles as savers, spenders, and investors. And so in the second generation of behavioral finance, finance, for example, people want to stay true to their values by investing in ESG funds. And we have heard about that a fair amount this morning. Or people just like to trade uh, as people like uh, to play uh, video games. In the third generation of behavioral finance, we want more than financial well-being. We want life well-being. And we know that financial well-being is only a way station to that goal of life well-being. So I'm going to speak about the various domains in the context of COVID. Uh, on the right, you see a photo of people standing in line in the early days of COVID uh, waiting for food. Uh, and in all of those domains, in each of those domains, there are three kinds of benefits, utilitarian, expressive, and emotional. The utilitarian benefits of finances are, what does it do for me and my pocketbook? I have food and shelter. Expressive benefits are about what does it say about me? I'm financially secure. I do not stand in line for food. And how does it make me feel? I have freedom from fear. Now, the domain of finance has a special place in life well-being. It is important on its own. You might have heard that a study that found that once your income is about $75,000 American dollars, your experience well-being does not change anymore. Experience well-being is really the emotions, the daily emotions, sadness, happiness, anger. Well, that actually turns out to be false. Uh, a subsequent study and Danny Kahneman, uh, who is one of the authors of the original study, uh, accepts that uh, the original study was, was flawed. In fact, both experienced well-being, again, these are the emotions, the daily emotions, and the evaluated well-being do increase without limit. But at a decreasing rate. And so uh, an increase in family income from 20,000 to 60,000 adds as much 
to well-being as an increase from 60,000 to triple that 180. So money is important. Anyone who tells you about relationships and so on, sure, they are important, but money is really important more than that. Money underlies, finances underlie all well-being domains. We need finances to support ourselves and families, paying for food, shelter, and schooling. We need finances to maintain our health and that of our families. We need finances to pay for education that would qualify us as for well-being and well-paying and satisfying jobs and careers. Even religion, I found this, this quote that I thought was really quite interesting about Doug Lynham, uh, who used to be a monk, and now he is a financial advisor. And he said, for too long, religion and money have been held separate, as if the very existence of one sullied the other. But the cold hard truth of modern life is that we need money, even monk. I discovered this fact the hard way when our community went bankrupt. Now, our problem in finances and in life, when we are young, we need to save so that we'll have money to spend when we are old. This is especially true in the US and I understand in New Zealand, when defined contribution plans are replacing defined benefit pensions. And so the usual problem that we describe is that we attempted to spend too much when young. And to counter that, those of us, people like you and me, conscientious people, use the mental accounts, framing mental accounts, into say capital and income and use a self-control rule that says spend income but don't dip into capital and so what we do is we move money say from our regular salary into a 401k savings account to the equivalent in new zealand and we use a self-control says don't dip into capital, making it easy to move money from income into capital, but not back into income to spend. These are my parents uh, holding our first daughter, our first child, uh, their first uh, grandchild. I learned as we all do, I learned about finances first from my parents. So my dad had a system where he opened the savings accounts for me when I was a kid. And whatever money I put in, he would double. I did the same thing for my children. My mother, I remember going with her to a bookstore uh, perhaps in fourth grade, to get the textbooks for the coming year. Uh, we got all the books from that uh, bookseller. She added up all the numbers. Uh, and then my mom said, is it possible to get a discount? I felt really embarrassed. For some reason, I thought that bargaining is, is unbecoming. But the Bookseller said, that's perfectly okay, Mayor. Uh, it is perfectly fine to ask for a discount. And she provided a 10% discount. And as you can see, as you can hear, that story stayed with me. So I'm speaking about how it is that we learn. What is financial literacy? And you've probably seen some of those questions about financial literacy. They deal, for example, with, with compounding. These, I think, are less important. Uh, you really have to have true literacy. And I wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal some years ago 
And I had some uh, true and false questions relating to that. And I said, here's an example. A surgeon perfects her surgery and increases her rate of success as she performs surgeries more often. Therefore, by analogy, an investor perfects his trading and increases his rate of success as he trades more often. Uh, is it true or false? And I said it is false uh, because the analogy does not hold. That is, the uh, surgeon does not find that the body is competing against him or her. Uh, the body does not move the heart from left to right just to confuse the surgeon. But of course, every time you trade, there is somebody on the other side and that somebody say has more information or better skills. And so I use the analogy of a tennis game. People tend to think that trading is like playing tennis against the practice wall when in fact it is tennis that possibly is against a Djokovic or, or an insider. I also had this example. I said uh, the price of a venti latte at Starbucks is a bit more than four dollars, amounting to approximately five hundred dollars a year. If you use, if you drink ten lattes each month, uh, if you are twenty-five, the five hundred from just one year's worth of lattes would compound to a bit more than 5,000 in the 40 years until your retirement in at 65, if you save it in an account that yields 6% annually. So it is best you forgo lattice. And I said that too is false. And I used the following analogy. I said uh, that a supply of diapers uh, for one year's uh, newborn is also about $500, and yet no one will advise you to have your kids when you are 65. So I quote my mother, uh, and she said, spend money, but don't waste it. Don't make saving a virtue and spending a vice. And I think that too often financial advisors uh, have the inclination to make saving a virtue and spending advice. And that is odd because as financial advisors, you know that the real problem you have with older people is that they are so good at saving that they just forget what spending is all about. It is just too painful for them to dip into capital. What are the other Domains of well-being, family, utilitarian benefits are about supporting my family and community. Uh, expressive benefits says I am a responsible parent and contributor to my community. And emotional benefits, of course, there is love within a family. Health, of course. Again, in the time of COVID, we could see that uh, most acutely being able to perform all of life activities are utilitarian benefits, but you also have the expressive benefits of not being dependent on caregivers and being free of pain. Work, uh, of course, it has the utilitarian benefits of earning money, but also contributing to my family and community and enjoying the sense of accomplishment and camaraderie. One of the things that people, I think, miss the most uh, in the time of COVID working from home is that camaraderie. Yes, uh, there was no commute, but seeing co-workers, colleagues, on Zoom, uh, you can do your work, but it is not as much fun. And education, enjoying higher earnings, being an educated person who continues learning, enjoying curiosity. 
I pause here to talk about status seeking uh, as one of the uh, things, benefits that we look for in all of those domains. Uh, of course, when you think about money, you ask yourself, why does somebody with a billion dollars work to get another billion? It is not because uh, they cannot buy lattes or steaks or even buy another mansion. Uh, it is because they are competing with the people who already have two billion uh, or, or more. It is about status. And I don't know the educational system, the university system in New Zealand well enough to say, but in the US, in the last decades, uh, the issue of status has really become prominent and the university systems has this, this steep pyramid where people compete to death. People even pay bribes in the hundreds of thousands to get their kid into an Ivy League uh, college. Uh, and you can ask yourself, is that for the earnings? Yeah, there are some differences in earnings, but they are really small, uh, not explaining why it is that people compete so fiercely. And <laughs> we just heard about ESG plenty. Uh, and you ask yourself before ESG, we had social responsibility investing. And of course, people, uh, even people who are socially responsible need to retire someday. Uh, and that woman says, truth be told, I'm as financially ambitious as I am socially conscious. And so people look for high returns, but also for the expressive benefits of being socially responsible and uh, for that peace of mind because my finances and values are in alignment. Now, a few things about, about the role in the business of financial physicians, financial advisors. Uh, the question is, how is it that you get and retrain uh, your customers, your colleagues, uh, your, your, your clients, sorry? Uh, the answer is that when you ask yourself, how is it that, that people find you as an advisor, 59% of the cases are by, by referral. Uh, local office, 10%. Event sponsored, 7%, personal relationship, 7%. And so what it really says is that if you advertise yourself as your services are beating the market, I don't think that it's going to be wise. For one thing, you are not going to be able to beat the market. And even if you beat the market on average, you don't do it every year. And your clients are going to be mad in those years where you don't. Uh, beat the market. And so uh, what what uh, you do, again, if you think about the analogy to, to uh, physicians, you do not get people to live forever. Uh, you treat them uh, enhancing their health. Uh, and you do it in a way that makes them feel closer to you. And so if you ask yourself, what is a trusted financial physician, what's the trusted financial advisors? The emotional component advisors providing peace of mind is 53% of the total clients feel valued and respected and their objectives and feelings are understood. That is that emotional component. There's a functional component of doing what you said that you'll do. And then there is an ethical component. All of them are important, uh, but not as much as that emotional component. Now I turn, I talked about saving and spending, and I now talk about older investors, older clients, where they are transitioning from accumulation to decumulation. And now the problems are really quite different. Uh, 
will we run out of money? How long will we live? Uh, what will be our living expenses and medical expenses? And here, the same mental tools of framing and, and, and mental account and the rule of don't dip into capital really trip us, making it hard for us to spend even after we have accumulated a good chunk of money. And I like to say that it is better to give with a warm hand than a cold one. Uh, it is better to give to kids when they are in their 20s and they need that money than when you are gone at 95 and your kids are in their 60s. And here is me. Uh, this is in 1969. I was 22, standing next to Nava, my 21-year-old bride. The story I want to tell with that is that the first time my parents uh, traveled to see Nava's parents, we shared dinner. And after that, uh, Nava and I were excused to go for a walk and our parents sat down to business. Business meant how much each pair of parents is going to give the young couple to get them started to have a down payment on, on an apartment. Uh, and Nava's mom said to her dad, whatever Bayer's parents offer, we are going to match. And at that time, they had less money than my parents, and they scrounged, uh, they borrowed from, from uh, relatives, uh, and they came up uh, with, that, uh, with that money. But, and, and I want to tell you the other half of the story. Uh, when uh, I was unhappy with the job I had in Israel after graduating from university, and I was thinking about coming to the United States to get my PhD, at some point, it looked like the finances will not work out. Uh, and so I went to my dad and I asked if I could get a loan. And he said, look, Mayor, I'd love to, but you have a younger brother and sister, and I would like to be able to help them as much as I helped you. And unfortunately, I don't have extra to lend to you. Everything turned out okay at the end. But the point really is that when I say it is better to give with a warm hand, it has to do with the capacity, the ability of parents to give, uh, considering their own old age and other kids that uh, might need their help. And so I'm going to conclude here by coming back to a point that I made before, that good financial advisors are good well-being advisors, that good financial advisors are good financial physicians, and in the same way that physicians promote health and well-being, good financial advisors promote wealth and well-being, and that the most difficult and the most important task of financial advisors is really managing investors. And that really is why I say that robo-advisors are not about to uh, make you unemployed. Uh, people still need that part. People get scared. People are ignorant. Uh, and uh, you can help them as a good teacher, a good caring financial physician. Thank you all very much. Uh, Mia, thank you um, for your insights and for, for sharing that, particularly from a behavioral finance perspective. Uh, we'll take some questions from the audience shortly, but one to just kick off. Um, particularly from a behavioral finance perspective, how do you balance uh, this importance of rational decision-making with the psychological factors that can influence our investment decisions? Uh, because obviously they're in competition, aren't they? 
Well, they can be. So, so here's one example. Uh, dollar cost averaging. Dollar cost averaging is kind of a puzzle that, that I tackled many years ago. Uh, and the, what economists, what financial economists will tell you is that if you received $100,000 as a bequest and you intend to put it into, uh, into stocks anyway, you should do it right now. Uh, and and uh, people find that really hard to do. Uh, and so people use dollar cost averaging, say dividing it into 10 components and uh, investing it say once a month on a particular day. Now, people say that it is because dollar cost averaging reduces risk, uh, but the real benefit of dollar cost averaging is not in real in risk reduction but really in regret reduction that is uh what people are afraid of is that the moment they put their one hundred thousand dollars in stocks the stock the god of the stock market is going to collapse the market and uh, and they're not going to be able to uh, do anything about it and so when I think about it, I say, look, rationally speaking, you want to put it all in a lump sum, but people are averse to regret. I am averse to regret. Uh, it is better to have it done in increments rather than not at all, because otherwise people stand there like, like people at the edge of the pool, uh, afraid to jump in. Whereas if you let them get in one toe at a time, uh, they are going to get in. Okay, um, question from the audience. Uh, regarding the U-shaped happiness curve as we age, how are different generations rating themselves compared to others at the same age? Well, you know, people have notions of what it is like to be old. And generally people think that as we get older, we are not going to be as happy. But in fact, uh, what the evidence suggests, and, and I think that just thinking of my life and I'm old enough to have gone through this uh, cycle to this U curve, uh, in fact, things are better. I really let uh, things slide now, you know, somebody forgot to cite my work. Well, big deal. Uh, it used to annoy me years ago. Uh, I don't pay much attention to it uh, right now. Can you give us a perspective too on um, fees? Uh, in your opinion, what's a fair fee for a well-being advisor service? Because this is obviously hotly debated. Are you talking about the fee? What kind of fee they can charge? Yes. Uh, well, <laughs> it is what what the market would bear. But but the the, the point of it is not uh, for me to say that it should be uh, one percent or fifty basis points. Uh, the point really is, and that is a hard job. I don't I don't uh, say otherwise uh, to persuade people that what the advisor is there for them is not to build that pie chart of the optimal portfolio, but rather to guide them on those really important uh, things in life that bring well-being. That, that is beginning with a question of how's your family doing uh, and perhaps disclosing their own pains of family such that they can elicit uh, the the pain in in others and and then uh, when you have done that when you have created that emotional connection very much like a physician at some point you think less on about the the money you pay and more about that sense of comfort that you can share with a uh, financial advisor those things that are really most important and sometimes most painful for you. Uh, Mir, just linking back to the earlier presentation, we heard from um, Aswath Damodaran who, who talked to us about this 
uh, this, this issue of narrative and numbers, uh, storytelling and data, uh, and his argument, of course, is we, we've switched too much towards data. So given your research into investor behavior, what do you believe is the most effective way to communicate financial information to individual investors in a way that will resonate with them emotionally and rationally? Well, you know, again, using this analogy of a physician, uh, we expect a physician to be on the frontier of knowledge of medicine and yet have that uh, bedside manner. And we expect the same thing from a good financial advisor. Uh, now, how to explain things? Well, you know, as, as uh, us one uh, said, uh, you know, there, there are people who come from the number side or the story side, and you have to figure out who they are. Uh, I remember somebody who showed me sort of a pictures of efficient frontier from the left and from the right and from the top and from the bottom uh, made no sense uh, whatsoever. Uh, I think that that most people are going to be uh, more moved by by an analogy or be educated by an analogy, uh, by a story. And of course, the numbers matter. But remember, the, the numbers part uh, is now taken over by robo advisor. I don't even talk about chat GPT. Uh, so the real service and the real advantage uh, that you bring to your clients is in call it the story side or the education side rather than in uh, claiming that you can beat the market or getting a portfolio that is just right on the mean variance efficient frontier. Uh, question around uh, risk, uh, risk adversity, particularly in the geopolitical landscape we have at the moment. So, um, when there are major geopolitical events and people are increasingly becoming risk averse, how do you recommend helping people in these times? Because there are certainly no shortage of things to worry about at the moment, are there? No, but, but that is true any time. That, that is any time people say, whoa, the world has never been riskier than it is now. And I think that, again, uh, good advisors, I think, begin by admitting that they too know what fear is. Uh, now they can say, look, what I bring to the table is knowledge. Uh, and I am sharing that knowledge with you as a teacher does. Uh, and so saying that fear is a natural emotion and God put fear in us, uh, or evolution put it in us for good reason. Uh, but sometimes fear can be exaggerated. And so we have to be able to engage our cognition, move away from our emotion and analyze it with a good cognition in the same way that we say, when you're angry, count till 10 before you open your mouth. Can you give us an example of a successful investment decision, uh, e either one that you've made yourself or one that you're aware of, uh, that was made primarily due to emotional or intuitive factors rather than pure analysis of the numbers? Well, here is one that has to do with me. So, so when I had to choose whether I'm going to buy a house or rent one, I did not run the numbers. I just knew that I'm going to buy a house. Uh, it may not have been right financially. It may not have been the best in my financial well-being, but it sure was better in my life well-being because the, the joy of being able to remodel the house in my way to hang the pictures that I want to do, uh, is really important. And second, uh, the same really applied in my case uh, about the decision about mortgage. Uh, should I pay off my mortgage or not? Uh, when I could pay off my mortgage, I paid it off. Uh, I just uh, thought that for my peace of mind, for my life well-being, 
Uh, I'd rather not deal with it. That that in fact, what money gives me is the chance to enhance my well-being. And so, at some point many years ago, I paid off my mortgage uh, and did not look back to see whether it was wise financially or not. Mia, we're out of time. Thank you so much. We do appreciate you joining us, particularly um, all the way from uh, California, where I'm sure it's a lot warmer than it is uh, here at the moment. But uh, we do thank you for your time and your insights. We send you our best wishes from New Zealand. Can I ask you please to join me in thanking Mia Statman?